I'm Matthew, and today Saba and I are going to be telling you about Deep Breach, which is an attack that we developed against databases. Encryption is one of the most important tools for protecting sensitive data, both at rest and in transit. Additionally, compression is often paired with encryption in order to save on storage costs. However, combining the two can be risky and sometimes leak the underlying plain text information. This class of vulnerabilities is known as a compression side channel. One context in which encryption and compression are commonly combined is in databases, which brings us to our attack, Dbreach. In Dbreach, an attacker is able to recover other users', in users encrypted content by utilizing a compression side channel. We were able to extend on techniques and the name of the crime and breach attacks uh, beyond the web security context and to the database context. And Dbreach is, we believe, the first um, compression side channel attack on a real world database system. Just a quick roadmap of what we're going to talk about today. So Saba is going to walk you through some background on uh, encryption and compression in databases and side channel attacks in general. Then I'm going to tell you about how our attack works, uh, some of the implementation roadblocks and, and solutions that we came up with. Um, I'm going to talk about how efficient and accurate we were able to make our attack. And then finally, I'm going to discuss some possible mitigation so that you, uh, you will be able to avoid this attack or similar attacks on your own systems. And now I'm going to hand it over to Saba to give you some necessary background information. All right. Thanks, Matthew. So let's start out by um, talking about what we mean when we say an encryption scheme is secure. So when we say encryption is secure, informally, we're saying that a ciphertext reveals nothing about the message that's being encrypted except the message's length. And this accept the message's length is the piece that kind of allows compression side channel attacks to happen. So what a compression side channel is going to do, the key idea is to use compression to reveal message's length. Um, and then by looking at length information, we're able to learn something about the message contents. And that's where the compression side channel comes from. So messages that compress more are shorter, messages that compress less are larger. And if you can uh, set it so that learning something about the message's length tells you about the, the message content, then you have a compression side channel. So compression side channels have famously been used in the crime and breach attacks to uh, break TLS. And I'm gonna give a very, very high level overview of the intuition behind these attacks, just so we can draw some lessons on how compression side channels can be used. So the setting here is we have a client and a server who have a compressed and encrypted channel between the two of them, over which they send secret information that they, that they want to, to send to each other. And there's an attacker who wants to learn the secrets that they're communicating with each other. So what the attacker has to be able to do to make this attack work is the attacker has a guess as to what the secrets might be. And the attacker gets the client to include its guess in the messages that it sends to the server. So for example, the attacker could be, the client might navigate to a web page that has some malicious JavaScript and the JavaScript gets the, gets the client to send the attacker's guess as part of the messages that are sent over the secure channel. So now the messages between the client and the server will include not only the secrets that they're sending back and forth, but also the guess that the attacker has as to what the secrets might be. The final step of the attack is for the adversary to be able to observe the size of the encrypted messages that are going back and forth between the server and the client. And the idea is that the adversary is looking to see if the, if the guess kind of compresses with the secrets. So if the guess is correct, and it's exactly the same as the secrets that are being sent back and forth, these things will compress together and the message won't get that big. So the adversary will know that it has a correct guess. On the other hand, if the guess and the secret don't compress with each other, if they're just different things that are not compressible together, then the attacker knows that it guessed wrong and it can guess something else. And it can do this iteratively until it gets the secrets right. So let's zoom out and think about what, the, what is required to make an attack like this work. So the first requirement is that encryption and compression have to be used together here. Um, and of course, this is happening. And it's important that encryption always comes uh, after compression, because if you compress before you encrypt, then you get the compression, and then you encrypt. But if you uh, do it the other way around, then the encryption is going to make the messages look kind of random, and random strings are incompressible, so the compression won't do anything for you. So if you want to use encryption and compression together, compression always has to come first. That's the first requirement. Next requirement is the attacker is somehow able to inject messages into this compressed and encrypted channel between the client and the server. And the third requirement is that the attacker has to have access to the size of the messages that are going back between these parties. 
And the question we want to answer in this work is where else do all these factors come together? And uh, from the title and from Matthew's introduction, you know that databases are a place where all of these factors are going to come together. So uh, I'm going to give now some background on how encryption and compression work in MariaDB and the InnoDB storage engine, just because these are this is what we use to instantiate our attack, although the attack in general can apply to many different DBMSs and different storage engines. So MariaDB offers what's called data at rest encryption, which is a feature that transparently encrypts data before writing to disk. So it has a bunch of different offers for key management, but ultimately what happens is whatever storage or en engine you're using uh, does its management of the tables in the database, and then when it's time to write those tables to disk, there is a transparent encryption step that happens just before the write to disk takes place. Easy enough. Also, MariaDB offers many options for compression, um, which as I mentioned before, always happens before the encryption. So one is called storage engine independent compression. This is a MariaDB feature that uh, kind of compresses the contents of each cell within a table. This is good if you are if you have a database table that has like large strings or large blobs of text that you're putting into it and you just wanna compress those things. But it doesn't do any compression between different parts of a table. So between different rows or different columns. Um, then there is InnoDB's compression features, which do allow this. So InnoDB has table compression and transparent page compression, which are two different compression offerings. And I'm gonna focus on the transparent page compression because it's the more recent one. It has some performance benefits over the table compression. It's also simpler and it's gonna be the one that we're gonna use in our attack. So how does InnoDB's page compression work? Well, it handles compression transparently before encrypting and writing to disk. So just like the encryption was transparent just before the write to disk, the compression is gonna transparently happen on the table before that table is encrypted and written to disk. So how does this work? The compression is gonna compress the data within each database page. So in the InnoDB storage engine, um, each uh, table is broken up into 16 kilobyte pages. And the compression feature is gonna compress each of these pages separately before writing them to disk or before encrypting them and then writing them to disk. So as you can see on the slide, there's gonna be some kind of empty space um, after each compressed page before the next page begins. And what the file system is gonna do is it's gonna use a feature called hole punching to reclaim this empty space and use it for other stuff. So what hole punching allows the file to do is if there is a file that's sparse and it has a big gap in it, um, it can do a hole punch in the file and take that punch away. And the hole punch has to be in a multiple of four kilobytes because the file system page is typically going to be four kilobytes and the hole punching kind of applies to whole pages at a time. So if you have a little bit of extra compression beyond the one page mark or if the page, uh, if a database page doesn't compress enough to result in saving an entire file system page, then there isn't going to be a hole punch. And what this means is that uh, this compression feature only helps when there's enough compression to remove a whole file system page. Otherwise, you don't get the compression. And this is important for our attack because it affects the granularity of information that an attacker can get about how much compression is happening in the database table. So in terms of the actual compression algorithms that are being used, um, page compression um, supports a number of different algorithms, but only Zlib, LZ4, and Snappy are installed by default in a standard Ubuntu build. And all three of these have a similar structure. They begin with a sliding window compression, where there's a sliding window that begins at the beginning of the page, of the database page, and whenever it finds a duplicate of a string that has occurred earlier in the window, it'll remove the second instance of the string and replace it with a reference back to the first instance of the string. What this means is that the second instance of the string doesn't need to appear in the file anymore, and that makes the file smaller, allowing it to be compressed. Zlib has an additional step that's not present in the other two, and this is a Huffman coding step, where at the end, after doing the sliding window compression, it uh, compresses more frequently occurring strings by giving them shorter representations. Um, and this is something that Matthew will talk about later that kind of has some uh, complications for when it comes to making an attack on these things. So with that background, Matthew's now going to tell us about our actual attack. Thanks, Saba. So first, I want to talk a little bit about the threat model, or the capabilities that an attacker needs to achieve in order to pull off the attack. First of all, an attacker needs the ability to insert and update into a database table. Also, an attacker needs to be able to assess the size of the compressed table. 
Note that these two requirements mirror the requirements for the breach and crime attacks that Saba talked about earlier. We believe that this threat model is realistic and achievable, and here's how. Insert and update capability can be achieved through a front-end web interface that's backed up by a database table, um, something that's really common in a lot of databases. For example, if the table was account metadata, the web interface could be your edit profile or create profile page. Additionally, MariaDB provides these things called column level permissions, uh, which can grant partial selectability on only certain columns. Um, and using this partial selectability, an attacker can, be, can gain updatability on the entire table um, as long as they only read those columns while they're doing the updates. So uh, it would kind of be a coincidence for the permissions to be set up that way, but it is possible for the database permissions to just be set up in such a way that you have insert and update capability, but you can't read the whole table. Additionally, to be able to assess the size of the compressed table, an attacker can read the size of the table file, file if they can gain read access to the file system. Um, so they need to gain some sort of read access, but once they do, they can just use a tool like ls to see how big the table space file is. Um, an attacker could also monitor network packets if, uh, if database backups were happening and see how big those are, but um, that's probably more complicated and not as easy as just getting read access to the file system in most cases. One final thing to note is that if an attacker is not able to achieve update permissions, uh, but can get write access on the file system, then they can force an update by rolling back the table file and inserting. Um, so this requires more comprehensive file system access, but fewer database permissions, and it's just a different means of gaining the necessary capabilities. Um, that would slow down the attack significantly, though, because forcibly rolling back the table is a lot slower than just running one update um, SQL command. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about our attack algorithm. And on the right here, I'm gonna keep this diagram of table layout in which this blue rectangle is one file system page, so four kilobytes. Initially, we just have some plain text that was inserted by other users. Um, that's represented by the green rectangle. It could be any, any number of rows as long as it fits on this file system page. One thing to remember with this attack is we're only recovering information from the most recent file system page uh, because that's how large the compression window is. Or, sorry, we are only recovering information from the most recent database page because that's how large the compression window is. First, an attacker is going to add random filler rows until the table grows. Um, these filler rows are just normal rows with the text fields filled with some random non-compressible text. Uh, they're gonna keep inserting rows until they overflow the file system page and a new page is added. Once they overflow the page and a new one is added, they're gonna update the first filler row to contain their guess, which is represented by that yellow box there. One thing to, uh, or, or the key idea here is that if the guess is a repeated string from the target plain text, then some compression will take place. And if it's not, then no compression will take place. The attacker then wants to figure out how, compressive, how much the guess compressed with the plain text. And to do so, they're gonna bite by bite make the filler rows compressible. This takes the form um, in practice of just switching the text in the filler rows to all be the same character from whatever random filler they were before. So the attacker goes byte by byte, making them compressible until eventually the whole table will have compressed enough such that it fits back on the old file system page and a whole bunch will take place as Saba talked about earlier. So that whole bunch will happen, the table will shrink and the number of bytes until the table shrinks is going to be what determines this guess's compressibility score. And that's what we're gonna use to compare guesses against each other. The key idea behind compressibility scores is just that a guess that results in a more compressible table layout because it is repeated from the target plain text should have a higher compressibility score. We're gonna calculate it uh, by defining this term BG for a guess G, 
which is the number of bytes that we made compressible in order to shrink the table. That's represented by the gray portion in this table layout diagram. We're then just gonna say that the compressibility score CG is one over BG. So therefore, if a guest was very compressible with the target plain text, it would take fewer bytes in order to, it would take uh, switching fewer bytes in order to compress the table or shrink the table. And therefore, uh, the compressibility score will be higher. Whereas if a guest did not compress with the target plain text, it'll take more bytes and therefore the compressibility score will be lower. So the aforementioned algorithm kind of lends itself very nicely to two main attack varieties. The first one is the K of N attack, which is given N options, which K are most likely to be in the table. And implementing this, uh, given the prior algorithm, is, is pretty simple. It's just we run that algorithm on all n of the guesses, and we pick the k guesses with the highest compressibility scores. Um, so now that you have some algorithmic background, I'm going to pause from the presentation briefly and, and start a little demo so you can see the k of n attack in action. So I have here a list of 500 names that were just randomly generated from commonly used names uh, in the US. And I'm going to generate a random number, 110. So we're gonna take the name at index 110, named Villanueva. And this name is going to be inserted into the table that we're about to set up. Now I'm gonna do some quick table setup. Uh, make sure that the table is not currently there. Oops. We're now going to create the table. Um, so the table in this case is just going to consist of a primary key ID, which is an integer, and a varchar data field, which will contain the name. Um, the engine is in a DB. Compression and encryption are both on. So we're going to create it. We're next going to insert the name that we just randomly chose into the victim table. And then finally, just gonna confirm that that is the only thing in the table right now. So there you have it. There's one row in the table. We're now going to run our attack in order to uh, figure out what we just inserted. So, um, we're going to run this demo. It's going to take a second, but you're going to see that it's inserting filler rows. Um, it took 29 insertions to create the table. It's calculating some reference scores. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And now it's starting to try each guess. So the actual act of trying the guesses um, takes a couple minutes. So I'm going to return to the presentation, and we're going to check in later to see how we did. In addition to the K of N attack, there's another attack that the prior algorithm really lends itself to, and that's the decision attack, which just asks, for a given guess, is it in the table, yes or no? This is decidedly more complicated than the K of N attack, uh, mainly because we need a reference point for the compressibility scores. Uh, we need to know what does the positive case look like and what does the negative case look like? What do the scores mean? To find these reference points, we're gonna calculate compressibility scores S yes and S no for strings that we know are in and not in the table. To determine S yes, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a substring from the first filler row that's the same length as the guess, and we're gonna insert it into the second filler row, and then we're gonna determine the compressibility score of that layout. So this is kind of mocking the positive case because we know for a fact that there's a repeated string that we just inserted into the filler data. To determine S no, we're gonna do something very similar, but we're gonna use a random string instead of a repeated substring. Um, the idea here is that the random string is very unlikely to occur elsewhere in the table. Then with these reference points, we're going to say that a guess's score, if a guess's score is within some threshold of S yes relative to S no, we answer yes. The reason why we need to do some threshold instead of trying to do an exact match is because as I'm going to talk about in a little bit, there are some sources of noise in the side channel that can obscure how, uh, what the compressibility scores precisely mean. One final attack that we can build out of our prior algorithm is a character by character ex extraction attack in which we use a K of N attack 
as a subroutine to extract plain text one character at a time. Um, so I'm gonna talk through the basic algorithm for this type of attack. And then I'm also gonna talk about some difficulties that we've encountered and we're currently encountering while implementing this. So we start with some known prefix that we strongly believe occurs in the table. In this case, the secret code is. From the prefix, we're gonna generate n guesses, where n is the size of the, the, size of the alphabet of all possible characters. Um, so if we're doing all English uppercase and lowercase characters, n would be 52, for example. These n guesses are going to be fed into a one of n attack submodule, which will pick which one option is most likely out of all 52, or all n. In this case, let's say that the first case, A, is the most likely. We're gonna take the most likely case and we're gonna make it the new prefix. From the new prefix, we're going to generate a new set of n guesses and repeat over and over until we've extracted the entire plaintext. Um, one thing to note here, however, is that if you look at these n guesses, the correct option and the incorrect option only differ by one character. Therefore, we expect that their compressibility scores will be quite similar, and we're a lot more vulnerable to sources of noise in the side channel. As such, this is still a work in progress, and we're working on developing a, a practical and accurate implementation. Uh, but we believe that the eventual solution will consist of this basic algorithm. Now I'm gonna talk through some roadblocks that we encountered while, uh, while implementing our attack and the solutions that we use to overcome them. One problem that we saw uh, repeatedly was what we ended up calling the substring superstring problem. We saw that we got a much higher rate of false positives when a guess is a substring or a superstring. That is, what is in the table is a substring of the guess. In the substring case, we see that the guess can is not an exact match with the plaintext, but the ground in the guess will match with the ground truth in the plaintext, or sorry, the ground from the ground truth in the plaintext, and compression will happen, so the guess will appear very compressible. In the superstring case, we see that, again, the guess has a, it, the guess, or much of the guess matches the plaintext and will therefore compress, um, making us vulnerable to false positives. One thing to note is the substring case is not really that bad. We're still identifying a valid substring that occurs in the table, um, which is the goal of the attack. So it's not really a false positive, and it really drives from the point, the importance of the attacker having a good set of initial guesses. The superstring case, however, is quite bad. This is a true false positive. The guess occurs nowhere in the table, and we would really like to avoid situations like this. To address the superstring problem, we switched to using the SES SNO reference point strategy on all guesses. Now, a guess's score is determined by how close it is to SES relative to SNO. And then, since SES is calculated using a string that's the same length as the guess, superstring guesses will only appear partially compressible relative to an exact match. So, in the prior example, ground truth regarding will only appear partially compressible compared to something of that length that was actually a precise match. Unfortunately, we're still slightly vulnerable to false positives if the superstring is not much longer than the ground truth because we might be within the threshold of S yes that is necessary to say, yes, it's in the table. Um, so while this is a big improvement, in cases such as the character by character extraction attack where the strings only differ by one character, we still sometimes uh, fall victim to this superstring problem. So as I alluded to a couple times before, we also encountered various sources of noise in the side channel that obscured the signal. The first source of noise that we saw uh, was from Huffman encoding. And this is, uh, is utilized in the LZIP compression algorithm. So in Huffman encoding, the precise ratio of characters relative to other characters can change, how uh, can change how compressible the table is, even if the guess is not compressing with the target plaintext. And since when we're inserting guesses, we are changing this ratio slightly, this introduces some source of noise. Luckily, this typically does not overwhelm the signal in the K of N or decision attacks because the compression of the guess is so much greater 
than the minor changes due to Huffman encoding. However, it poses a pretty serious problem for the character-by-character -character extraction attack um, in which we're only changing one character at a time, so the signal is weaker. Uh, we're continuing to address this problem, and um, the breach paper holds some useful hints that I, I won't have the time to talk about today, but we think that they'll come in handy as we continue to implement the character-by-character -character extraction attack. Another source of noise was compression with irrelevant parts of the table space file, such as metadata or our own filler rows. Um, so if the guest compresses with these, it'll have a high compressibility score, even though it doesn't match the target plain text. A solution here is to randomly choose the filler data from some disjoint alphabet that we believe will not occur anywhere else in the table. Um, this prevents compression with our own filler data and managed to mostly eliminate this source of noise in the side channel because it appears that compression with metadata is relatively unlikely. Additionally, we, we, saw some, uh, we occasionally saw compression within the guest itself. Uh, for example, if a guest contains many repeated substrings, it'll shrink because it's compressing within itself. It'll appear very compressible even though it doesn't match anything in the target plaintext. Solution here is to penalize the internally compressible guesses. Um, one way to do so is to break ties based on what is more or less internally compressible, or we could actually decrease the compressibility scores of very internally compressible guesses. Uh, the necessity of, of this solution kind of depends on the format of the guesses and can be toggled on and off as needed by the attacker. Finally, lots of deletions and updates can lead to a fragmented table space which can make our insertions happen on different pages, leading to unexpected behavior. Luckily, uh, this situation is fairly easy to detect because we just get nonsensical output. And since we can detect it, we can then retry and hopefully our previous failed attempt filled up all those fragments in the table space. One final optimization that we took was to maximize, uh, to maximize the efficiency of our tap um, relates to minimizing the number of database actions that we're performing, which is very important for evading detection. So previously, the real bottleneck for database actions was when we were continually updating in order to find the precise boundary at which, uh, at which the table will shrink back to that prior page. So previously, we performed a linear search across this entire, all this whole filler row to find the boundary, which as you can see, is painfully slow. Um, if R is the maximum row size, it could take up to R updates in order to find that boundary. We switched to using a binary search method to find that cutoff point, which now only takes log base two of R updates per guess. So big improvement, as you can see. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about how just how efficient and accurate we were able to make our attack. So that binary search optimization uh, really helped quite a bit. Again, if we say that R is the maximum size of a row, then while we're inserting, uh, while we're inserting filler rows, we must initially insert at most page size divided by R rows in order to overfill the page. Um, so in practice, with a mostly empty page and R two equals 200, it takes around 30 insertions. And then as we explained before, it takes just log base two updates per guess, log base two of R updates per guess to find that boundary at which point the table shrinks back to its prior size. So for N guesses, we perform only O of R plus N log R database actions. Um, we found that this was quite performant. And in practice, when R is 200, 200 bytes, a single guess takes only about 0.2 to 0.4 seconds. Um, and on the order of 10 updates or fewer. So in terms of accuracy, we were quite pleased with the results we were able to achieve. In this experiment, uh, we inserted some number K uh, rows onto a page, which were randomly chosen from a name set very similar to the one that you saw in the demo. Then if we inserted K records onto the page, we would run the K of N extraction attack uh, through all possible options that those records were randomly chosen from and try and pick which K were inserted. For low values of K, or when there's not many records on the page, we uh, achieved 
very high accuracy level. So if you look at one, it's over 95%. For two and four, uh, they're also over 90%. Also note that this x-axis is on a log scale. And then even as k gets quite high, so there's uh, 50, uh, over 50 or over 100 rows on the page, we remain, uh, we are still able to extract 75% or 70 plus percent of those records on average. One last thing I want to note is that it's, there's nothing really specific about MariaDB and ImageDB's implementation that makes them vulnerable to this attack. The, the issue is, is more fundamental. It's that the database compresses attacker and victim data together. And this occurs in all sorts of database management systems and storage engines. As such, we believe that other RDBMSs and, and storage engines are likely vulnerable to the same attack or very similar attacks. We think that MySQL is especially likely to be vulnerable since MariaDB is just a fork of MySQL and MySQL also uses the InnoDB storage engine. Now I'm gonna go over some possible mitigations for our attack. There are really two classes of mitigations. There's prevention, which is what DBAs and developers who are using databases can use to avoid falling victim to this sort of attack. And then there's actually patching the problem, which are more recommendations for the MariaDB developers or other database developers themselves. In terms of prevention, prevention we have a few strategies. First of all, don't use column level permissions for select capabilities. This attack clearly showed that these are broken and they provide attackers with half the necessary capabilities because they allow you to update over the whole table. Um, and then therefore, once you gain read access to the file system, they allow you to read the whole table or much of the table. Additionally, uh, DBAs or developers could monitor database usage for unusual activity patterns. Uh, this will look pretty similar to denial of service detection. If a single user is performing an unusually high number of inserts and updates or a very unusual pattern of inserts and updates, then it might be a good idea to block them from the database for some period of time. However, remember that after the binary search optimization, this takes, uh, checking one guess takes only about 30 insertions and 10 or so updates. Therefore, this DDoS detection strategy might be difficult if an attacker is only checking a small number of guesses. The only foolproof method for preventing this attack is to turn off compression. Or alternatively, switch to using the storage engine independent compression offering that MariaDB provides. In both of those cases, attacker data will not be compressed with victim data. Recall that in the storage engine independent compression, compression only happens within database cells, so within a column and row. Um, obviously, there's some performance hit for turning off compression, and storage will become more expensive. However, if the data is very sensitive, um, this might be worth it in order to protect the data. In terms of actually patching the vulnerability, we have a few suggestions. We believe that column level permissions for select should probably be deprecated or at least recommend it against until a more comprehensive solution is found. Uh, that's for the same reasons as mentioned earlier. Additionally, MariaDB could offer a compression option that compresses only within rows. So attacker data and victim data is not compressing together. So storage engine independent compression compresses only within row columns, so specific cells, uh, but perhaps compressing within rows will be more performant than that uh, while avoiding this issue. Another idea would be to compress only within rows inserted by the same user and user group. Um, so this feature doesn't exist yet, but if it were added, then it would prevent attackers from compressing with and therefore discovering other users' data. So now I'm gonna go quickly check in on how our demo went. Should be done by now. So we see down here, let me make this a little bigger. So it's able to uncover the secret name, James Villanueva. Remember that we inserted that above. Um, so, hooray. Okay, and now a quick conclusion. So in summary, uh, DeepReach is an attack on compression and encryption in databases. 
It derives from a simple and achievable threat model, and it is efficient and accurate. We believe that this really drives home the point that compression and encryption should be combined very carefully, lest you or your system fall victim to a compression side channel attack. Additionally, it raises the question of what other contexts besides databases and besides web security may be vulnerable to such compression side channel attacks. And I think there's plenty of opportunities for future work to address that. Okay, thank you. I'm happy to take any questions.